The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. In the first volume of this program, we were introduced to the nine main nations that make up the Southeast Asia region. They are Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore. We looked at the fascinating way of life on the Mekong River, the main river of the region. We also learned how Theravadan Buddhism and Hinduism came to Southeast Asia from India and helped shape the complex culture there. In volume two of this program, we will find out how the quest for Southeast Asian spices led European nations to begin exploring our planet. We will learn how Islam reached Southeast Asia from Arabia, discover the huge role that Chinese religion and traditions play in the culture of this part of the world, and finally, we will take a look at a group of native people in Malaysia who follow a way of life that is quite different from what we are used to in this modern day and age. In the early 1400s, Portuguese navigators were just starting to explore along the western coast of Africa, hoping to find a sea route between Europe and Southeast Asia. These explorations signaled the birth of what has come to be called the Age of Exploration, or Age of Discovery, one of history's most important eras. 600 years ago, nearly all of the essential cooking spices used in Europe were raised in the Malaku or Spice Islands, which today are part of Indonesia. Spices were extremely valuable in those days, mostly due to the fact that moving them all the way from Indonesia to Europe was such a difficult ordeal. First, they had to be transported in small ships by Muslim traders across the Indian Ocean to Arabia. And from there, the spices had to be hauled over land to the Mediterranean Sea on the backs of animals. Once a caravan reached a port on the Mediterranean Sea, they had to be transferred to ships belonging to the powerful Italian city-states of Venice or Genoa, who controlled the European spice trade back then. Other European nations, Portugal and Spain in particular, envied the great wealth of those two city-states and wanted to get into the spice business too. They thought the best way to do so would be to find a good sea route between Europe and what was then called the East Indies, a term which at that time referred not just to Southeast Asia, but to India and parts of China as well. A sea route would be much more efficient. It would eliminate the Arabian and Italian traders, and much larger quantities of spices could be moved on their much bigger ships. The first European explorer to actually reach the East Indies by sea was Vasco da Gama of Portugal. He sailed south from Europe, rounded the southern tip of Africa, and in 1498 landed at a major spice trading port in western India. Spanish explorers, beginning with Christopher Columbus in 1492, attempted to reach the East Indies by sailing west from Europe instead of east. But as they soon discovered, two previously unknown continents, North and South America, blocked their way. The Spanish didn't actually reach Southeast Asia until Ferdinand Magellan crossed the Atlantic, sailed around the tip of South America, and landed in the Philippines in 1521. Although Magellan was killed in the Philippines, crew members from his fleet were able to reach the Spice Islands. 
and sail back to Spain via the southern tip of Africa. By doing so, Magellan's surviving crew became the first people to complete the truly amazing feat of sailing all the way around the world. As we have just seen, in the centuries before European sailing ships arrived in Southeast Asia, most of the spices bound for that continent were transported from the Spice Islands by traders from Arabia, the land where Islam was founded by the Prophet Muhammad 14 centuries ago. It was these same Muslim spice traders who brought the religious and cultural traditions of Islam to this region of the world. Today, roughly 300 million people in the Southeast Asia region are followers of Islam, including the vast majority of the people who live in Indonesia and Malaysia. In fact, Indonesia, which is the fourth most populous country on Earth, is also the world's largest Muslim nation. And with so many Muslims living in the region, it is easy to understand why mosques are encountered here so frequently. Mosques are religious buildings where Muslims gather together for prayer, but they also serve as educational centers and as places where personal disagreements and disputes are settled as well. On the outside, many mosques have huge golden domes and are quite beautiful to look at. On the inside, a mosque is mostly a big open space. Men, called imams, lead the prayers at mosques. There are two basic kinds of mosques, small ones that are used mostly for daily prayers and larger ones where, in addition to daily prayers, the traditional Friday sermons are preached. Mosques have towers called minarets from which a man called a muzin sings out the call to prayer five times a day. So naturally, these melodious sounds are very much a part of the fabric of daily life in many parts of Southeast Asia. We have seen how the culture of Southeast Asia has been shaped by religions and traditions that originated in Arabia, India, and Europe. But in many parts of Southeast Asia, the ancient nation of China has also added important ingredients to the rich blend of cultures that distinguish this region of the world. China has had a really big cultural influence here, partly because it borders all of the northernmost countries of Southeast Asia and partly because it is the world's most populous country. Traders and laborers from China have been settling in Southeast Asia for centuries, and Chinese immigrants are still coming here today. That's why there are lots and lots of people of Chinese descent living in the region today. Wherever the Chinese settled, they started businesses, introduced their customs, language, music, food, and, of course, their religious traditions, too. The most imposing Chinese-style buildings in Southeast Asia are distinctive temples like this one in Singapore. And, as you can tell, it looks quite different from the Theravadan Buddhist temples of Laos and Thailand. That's because another branch of the Buddhist religion, called Mahayana Buddhism, is practiced here. This Chinese Mahayana Buddhist temple is filled with colorful and amazing statues to which offerings are made by the faithful. Some are of bodhisattvas or wisdom beings such as Avalokiteshvara, the bodhisattva of compassion seen here. While other statues in this temple include representations of fierce guardians of the Buddhist faith, but most Chinese temples that you see in Southeast Asia aren't actually Buddhist at all. Instead, most of them are used for the practices of Chinese folk religion. This is a loosely organized religion that combines elements of Buddhism with elements of Taoism and Confucianism, which are China's other two main religions. Taoism traditionally focuses on the worship of certain deities, such as the goddess of the sea, as well as the gods of prosperity, good fortune, and long life. 
while Confucianism, a religion based on the teachings of the ancient philosopher Confucius, is more focused on developing proper behavior and goodness. Taoism also incorporates figures from mythology and often involves the worship of nature gods and goddesses, as well as family gods, city gods, national gods, and cultural heroes. So the exact appearance of a Chinese temple will depend on how the elements of these different religious traditions are blended together. But no matter how they are combined, elaborate offerings will cover the altars in all of them, and incense will always be burning. The man seen here is making offerings of symbolic money to images of the God of Prosperity, hoping to increase his wealth. These offerings are later burned in the temple oven so that the smoke will ascend into heaven. Another thing you'll often see in Chinese temples is people practicing divination, which is an ancient method of trying to predict the future. During divination, a cup filled with sticks is shaken while praying to the god of good fortune. The stick that hits the floor has a number on it that holds the key to predicting your future. In Southeast Asia, one of the biggest holidays is the Chinese New Year celebration, an event that can last for 15 days. Chinese New Year is a time for new beginnings, a time for buying tangerines, red and yellow plants, and all kinds of other holiday gifts. It's a time when families enjoy lavish meals together. And Chinese New Year is also a time when lion dancers take to the streets, accompanied by quite a lot of loud music. The lion dance is traditionally performed to scare away the evil spirits of the past year and to summon luck and good fortune in the year to come. But mostly, it's performed just for fun. The dragon dance is another highlight of the Chinese New Year celebration. A dragon like this one can be created by as many as 50 people swirling around together to the sound of the dragon music. Dragons have great power and dignity in Chinese mythology and are believed to bring good luck. So in the Chinese culture, dragons are viewed as being something positive, not something bad at all. And that's why it's considered to be a big compliment when someone says that you acted like a dragon. Now that we've looked at some of the important outside influences that have shaped the culture of Southeast Asia, it's interesting to check out one of the native or indigenous cultures of the region as well. In this program, we are going to focus on the Iban people who live on the island of Borneo, in the part of Malaysia known as Sarawak. A century ago, Iban men were well known in Sarawak for their skills as headhunters and for their abilities as warriors too. Today, however, most of them spend their time quite differently, raising crops and catching fish. Some Iban people have converted to Christianity, but others still practice animism, an ancient religion that exists in traditional cultures all around the world. Animists believe that souls or spirits exist in animals and plants, as well as in everything else in nature such as rocks and water, too. The Iban people follow a unique way of life because they prefer to live together as a large group under one roof instead of living separately in a number of different houses. Originally, this was done for protection from other tribes. So a typical Iban village usually has one big building in it called a longhouse where everyone lives. Inside the longhouse, families share a single large living room that runs the whole length of the building. This is the place where people from the different families come together to socialize and tell stories. The longhouse seen here is home to 15 families. 
the doors off the side of the main living room lead to separate apartments for the families. Each is equipped with its own kitchen and places for sleeping. Guests who visit an Ebon longhouse are likely to be greeted by traditional welcoming music. Ebon music is performed by small percussion groups composed of people playing a combination of gongs, drums, and xylophones. Ebon music in some ways resembles the gamelan music of neighboring Indonesia, which typically features a lot of beautiful percussion instruments. The Ebons also like to perform traditional dances to entertain their guests. Ebon men and women have quite different styles of dance. For men, the style is more aggressive and depicts acts of going to war or of a bird flying. While the Ebon women prefer to dance with softer, more delicate movements. <laughs> 